Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Scrumptious, scrum diddly umptious. Is that what we used? Last service, it was yummy, and we made fun of him a little bit. So uh, he's just trying to delectable. Um, hey, let me just uh, first off say welcome if this is your first time here. Maybe it's been a while. Uh, my name's Josh. I'm the uh, lesser half of, of Brittany. Uh, and so we do have a privilege of serving as lead pastors here. And we're grateful that you're here with us. Um, we just believe God's doing something in our community, in the upstate of South Carolina. And uh, we also believe he's doing something special right here at Greenville First. And so it's always an honor to have new people come into the church because uh, we just love what God's doing. And so it's always a warm welcome that we want to extend. And I will tell you, it's not too late. Some people like show up to church and they're like, oh, I forgot to register for that lunch thing. Uh, or it's your first time here. We've had people who on their first Sunday have showed up to lunch with the pastors and uh, they're still a part of our church. And so it is just a wonderful uh, bridge for us. Uh, we like to share our story, share a little bit about the vision of what God's called us to. Uh, here's a church. And then you just get to meet some of our leadership team and we feed you and it's free and there's no strings attached. We're not asking for any commitments. Uh, it's just kind of a simple next step for us uh, in your journey of, of our prayer that we would be with you, uh, getting you to where Jesus wants you to be. And so um, we are uh, wrapping up our series closer today. And uh, we are really wrapping it up today uh, because next Sunday is Vision Sunday. And uh, we are excited about that. Uh, if you've never been here for Vision Sunday, Vision Sunday is always a lot of fun. Uh, why? Because we believe that vision comes directly from God. And, uh, and so we just kind of unpack a little bit of what we believe God's speaking to us. And, and uh, we kind of gave a little glimpse of that back in uh, November um, with our all in into the future. And so next week, uh, Brittany and I will share and we will uh, hopefully you'll be encouraged. And it's just always a good ramp up for where God's taken us for 2022. And, uh, and so we are excited about that. Now, the first few weeks of this series, we really talked about what does it look like for us to draw closer to God. And, uh, and last week, we kind of pivoted in the series and said, what does it look like for us to draw closer to God's mission for our life? And so last week, we really hit on that God does not intend for you to journey alone. He wants you to be in relationship and community with other believers uh, on this journey of life. And so today we're kind of sticking with that frame of, of getting closer to God's mission for our life. Um, but I want to set it up this way. I don't know uh, if you've ever built anything. And I'm just going to say anything. Um, we have some wonderful contractors in our church uh, who are responsible for building large things uh, like homes and, and office complexes and things of that nature. But if you have ever built anything, you know that there is, uh, there's never anything to be built that is really just a one-man job. I don't care how small it is, if it's a shed in the backyard or a shelving unit uh, for your closet, or maybe it's a house, maybe it's something larger. There takes some planning and some people to make it happen. I mean, you think about it. Brittany and I built a, our, our home a couple of years ago, and, uh, and it was just a wonderful delight to go through that process. Uh, if you've ever done it before, you know just how wonderful it is. Uh, people say, hey, what was it like building a house? We want to build one. I'm like, never do it. I want to ever do it again. I want to ever do it again. Uh, no, it really was wonderful, but it was a process. I think I just thought we'd pick a plan and then it was just, it would just happen. But it wasn't like that at all. And what I quickly realized is there were a lot of people that were involved in the process and the planning to make that happen. Like architects, for example, that drew out the plans before things could even get rolling. And then there had to be a real estate agent that would handle the transaction to purchase the land so that we had somewhere to build the house. And then there are these environmental people who had to come and look at the land and make sure you could build on it and make sure all your in surveyors to make sure you're in the right lines and everything else. And oh, then there's a general contractor who has to get subs and, and all the people from the foundation all the way to the roof shingles and every bit of paint and every bit of concrete and every bit of landscaping. There were a lot of people that were in the process of building. But here's the wonderful thing. God's got a plan to build. And he is 
the great architect. He is the greatest general contractor we would ever know. But here's what I love is he invites us to be subs in the plans to help execute exactly what he intends to do. There's not one man or one woman that can accomplish God's plan to building by themselves. It may would be a little easier if it was possible, but it's not. And here's the greatest part of this whole concept is that God invites you and I into the plan. He could accomplish everything he wants by himself, but he says, no, I love my sons and daughters so much that I want them to be participators, to be builders with me, to be a part of this plan and purpose that I have. Ephesians 4 verse 7 says this, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Here's our bottom line for today is that you were created on purpose for a purpose. Now, Paul says this in 4 verse 7, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And this is the setup for our main text for today because he continues in verses 11 through 16. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. But he continues. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you right now. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we have already had an opportunity to worship you today to spend time in your presence. God, I pray right now that you would just continue to, to speak to our hearts, encourage us. God, we are so honored that we get to be a, a part of the work that you're doing. In your name we pray, amen. Now, Paul's letter to the Ephesians here, I just wanna give you a little bit of background. I think it's always healthy to understand why someone wrote a letter or what's going on when the letter was written. And there was this town called Ephesus, the city, this community called Ephesus. And here's what's taking place in Ephesus. Ephesus was really the center of, of worship for Greek and Roman gods. But Paul shows up on the scene, and Paul is, is probably the greatest missionary that we have ever known, at least recorded. And Paul shows up on his missionary journey, and he begins to see people come to know Jesus. They say yes to Jesus. They become followers of Jesus. And years later, Paul finds himself in prison and he writes a letter to the church of Ephesus. Hence the name Ephesians. And so here we find in this book of Ephesus, there's six chapters and there really is two pieces of Ephesus. There's chapters one through three, which talks about the gospel. It is the good news of Jesus. It is everything that Jesus has done. And then there is a key word in between chapters 3 and 4, and it says, therefore, because Jesus did all this, now this is what the gospel should do to your life. This is how you should live. This is how your neighbor should see you. This is how you should live in your family. It is everything we need for what the gospel has done and then how it should change us. So here we find in Ephesians chapter 4, he's writing, and it is really, what does the church look like in action? Therefore, because Jesus died and he rose again, and he is the greatest news, therefore, this is what our life should look like. Therefore, this is what our church should look like. So here we have in these verses, Paul's just given us some simple instructions for what church in action might look like. The first thing we're going to talk about today is that we all have a purpose and a part to play. 
we all have a purpose and a part to play. So he says in verse 7, I'm going to read it again, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it, or he portioned it out. Now I want you to hear two things here. The focus in this verse here is that the portion of grace is different to every believer. But I need you to understand before we go there that we are not talking about the grace for salvation, the saving grace of Jesus that is for all of us and praise God that his grace covers all of us. This is a portion of grace that looks different for each of us in the body of Christ. Track with me. The portion of grace that is on Pastor Will is different than the portion of grace that God gave me. And many of you, because I can hear you singing on Sundays. <laughs> that is not meant to be an insult. It's just your portion of grace looks different than his portion of grace. But if your portion of grace might play drums or tickle the ivories or sing, tickle the ivories, that's just a weird <laughs> phrase. Play the piano. If your portion of grace includes that, then don't waste that grace because it's all different for us. Each of us, it is different. Romans 12, 6, Paul's writing again. He says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So what does this mean? You are uniquely gifted with the grace that God put on your life. He didn't give anybody else your grace. Your grace isn't the same as someone else's. It is uniquely for you. And when you've received this grace, it's because Christ gave it in such a measure for his purpose for you and for the body. It was unique for you. Now, I think about this, this idea of, of grace and, and portioned out, and I could not help as I was prepping to think about my own childhood of when my father would, would normally like slip me a $20 bill if I was going somewhere, and he would use these words, bring me some change. I was real good at bringing change. Like, yeah, 1999, we'll chalk it up. Dad, I brought you some change. Singular, penny, but it is change. Now I understand the pain of fatherhood because I have two of my own. And here's, here's the pain. The pain is not, it, well, it probably is handing our children money is painful, but it's really what they do with the money that is painful. If you're a parent in the room, you've probably experienced this pain of you take your children somewhere and you're like, okay, maybe it's a special day. They've done something great. You're giving them a reward. They're taking their allowance to the store, whatever the case may be. And you hand them that $20 or that $5 or whatever means it may be a dollar. Whatever you put in their hands and you're like, hey, we're going to, this is your budget. I pray your kids are not like mine. Because my kids think that quantity over quality is a good thing. So here's the behavior of my kids. They are going to find the cheapest things that they can get so that they can get a bunch of stuff when in reality they could afford something at a higher shelf with a lot more quality. Here's why it pains me. Because I know what's going to happen to the cheap stuff. If you've met my wife, it's going to be in the trash can in about 24 hours. Because it's going to be broken, missing parts, whatever the case may be, and it pains me. Why? Because there was a gift that was given, and it was squandered on things that don't matter. In the same way, we all have a purpose and a part to play, and when God has portioned his grace on us to fulfill a part in the body and the work of which he is, he is calling us to, and we're squandering it over here on these little diddly things, and oh, we're going over here, and we're squandering it here, and I just can't help but feel the pain of a father who looks down and says, that's not why I gave you that portion of grace. But we all have our reason of why we want these other things or we're wasting it away over here. Maybe we're just trying to be Scrooge and save up the money. I, I don't know what the cause may be, but all I know is that Jesus did not give you the grace that he has given, the portion of grace that he has given for your life for it to be wasted on stuff that does not matter. See, in the same way that mom and dad know best, so does Christ as the head of the body. 
So how do we, how do we refute what Christ says and that we were graced with his gift? How do we say, because I, I, I've heard, well, I'm not that and I'm not this. You're right, you probably aren't. But what has God gifted you and portioned grace upon your life for you to say yes to? See, all of this lays the foundation for verses 11 through 12. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. See, all of our lives, I, I think that for every one of us in here, there is something inside of us that wants to accomplish something, wants to make an impact. I have yet to meet someone in my life that says, I just really want to die and I don't want anybody to show up to my funeral because I really just don't want to have made an impact in anyone's life. I haven't met anyone that says, I just really just want to go dig myself a hole and stay there because I, I just don't want to do anything of significance in my life. If anything, I think that we spend our life trying to find significance in the wrong places and accomplishment in the wrong places, but it's still inside of us to make an impact and to make a difference. See, I think about it this way. If somebody bought a piece of property, if we had just bought that piece of land and said, hey, one day we're going to build a house on it. One day we've got great plans. When the kids get out of the house, we're going to make this happen. When I, when I get to this piece of my life or, or all these things get in order, I'm going to make good on it. Well, I've seen more times than not good intentions gone bad and gone empty. We dream it up. We plan. We vision for it. And there's no action behind it. And so all it is is an empty plot. It's wasted grace. It's this it's this concept that, that we say, hey, one day I'll be where I need to be with Jesus so that I can, I can start serving and I can be a part of the church. Or, or I, I hear this a lot when it comes to giving. Well, one day I'll make enough money or I'll, I'll get my house in order so that I can, I can be obedient to Scripture. Or one day when my kids aren't so crazy, I'll actually take time to dig into God's Word and establish a relationship, an intimate relationship with Him of where I know my Heavenly Father. All of these things are one day and it's some point and all it is is a barren piece of land that nothing ever happened but see we've all been invited to be a part of the plan and we've all been given a purpose of which Christ has given us the exact amount of grace that we need to do what he's called us to see Christ himself gave the offices of the church the apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers to equip and we're going to come back to that in point two his people so that the body of Christ may be built up. That means that none of us in the body of Christ are exempt or excused or too much or too little for what God has for us. See, I think over the course of our life, we have some things that affect our confidence when it comes to saying yes to what God has. Because everything in our life is an audition, a tryout, or an interview. I mean, you think about it. I mean, from, from the time our kids are young, we're testing them in school to see where they, where they land. And depending on where they land depends on, on, on what is afforded to them. And then we get into to maybe even elementary school, athletics, middle school. There's tryouts for teams and we want to sort people out based on their skill level. And then we get into the real world of life and we're doing job interviews and we're always constantly measured on our abilities and what we have. So I think oftentimes we've experienced so much rejection and so much insecurity because we know we're always being measured by everybody in our life that we keep from saying yes because we're afraid that we just may not make the cut when it comes to what God has. And if God only knew what I struggle with, if God only knew my past, if God only knew my insecurities, can I tell you, he created you. You think he doesn't know what you struggle with and how you have difficulties and what you, what you have anxiety with? He knows every bit of it and he's still giving you the amount of grace to do what he's called you to do. See, I think that we just allow these fears to keep us from saying yes. 
But I want to tell you, don't let the fear of failure or rejection keep you from playing your part because when you say yes to God, there is a part and a purpose for you to play. Don't spend your whole life talking about making a difference and not doing anything about it. And don't waste the grace that Jesus has given you. We have a part to play. The second thing is this, is there's always repair work to get done. There is always repair work to get done. Verse 12 says to equip his people for works of service. Now this word equip here literally means to fix something that's broken or supply something that is lacking. The very word would have been used in fixing nets. Some of the disciples were fishermen. This was a constant, constant connection to people in these communities. And Paul writes that Jesus gave the leadership of the church to help fix what's broken in people. I want to reword, uh, reread the, the verse 11 and 12 and just exchange equip for the definition. And I want you to hear it this way. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to fix something that is broken in people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Or let's try this one. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to supply something that is lacking in his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Here's what that tells me. Our job is never done and there's always repair work to take place. I don't know about your house, but my house, we haven't even been there two years and there still always seems to be something to be fixed and repaired. Anybody else, it doesn't matter. You can live in an apartment, a townhome, a house, a mansion, an estate. There's always something to be fixed. All right. Wives, of all you husbands that didn't say anything right then, can I get an amen from you on their honeydew list? I mean, there is always work to be done. It never stops. There is not a quip. And then there's this ending point. It is a cycle that continues to be done. It's, it's similar to this phrase, a mother's work is never done. Neither is repair. But here's the best part. All that means is there's work to be done in, in us and there's work to be done through us. See, I, I, I can handle a little bit more of recognizing that I've got more work to be done in me because I've also recognized that God's got more work to do through me. There is a confidence that he's invited us to play a part and he's given a purpose for our life. And even though I'm broken and even though I'm still in need of a savior on a daily basis, every breath I breathe, I need Jesus to be all over me. I need his Holy Spirit flowing and working in and through me on a constant Okay, there's a few of you that woke up this morning because I'm constantly fighting the brokenness that is still in my life. I, I want, I want, I want, we're just, we're gonna grab the fish in that for a moment. Because here's what I want you to see. I went to unrattle this uh, first service and it was actually broken. It needed to be mended. So I spent the last hour in between services mending the net. Y'all know me better than that. <laughs> but here's this word. This word equip means to mend the net. Now, I, I don't know if you've ever used a fishing net. I haven't. <laughs> but I feel like they do something like this. Like throw the net. I, I just felt like that was very graceful. See, the grace of God was on me to toss the net. <laughs> to equip, to mend the net. Now, the people that were reading this letter would have fully understood exactly what Paul was meaning because fishing and nets would have been very, very close to, to people in that region and understanding the necessity of why nets need to be mended. Now, when I began to do the word study and realized that equip really meant to fix nets, I'm like, oh, we're, we're going for a deep dive here because to me, my first my first reaction is, oh, the net has to be fixed so that they can catch more fish. And Jesus tells us that we're to be fishers of men and not fish. So we've got to mend so that we can catch more fish, but there's more to it than that. 
It's not that just more fish can be caught. It's if you have holes in your net, you are going to damage the fish that you don't catch in the process. Now let that sink in for a moment. When we don't recognize that we're in need of repair and that we're still broken individuals in need of a savior, and when we say yes to Jesus, Jesus created the church to help people continue to be fixed and repaired, and we're not perfect by any means. We're going to talk about that in a second. And in the case so that when we're throwing our nets, we stop hurting people and we're actually catching the fish that God intended for us to catch. So when I do not respond to the fixing and the repair that God is trying to do in my life, I, can, I have the potential to create greater damage than the fish that I'll ever bring in. There's always repair work to be done. Now here's where I, I, I rest in the confidence of this, and this is where we really get to play the part, is because on one end, it shows that you are needed by the church to build up the body. And on the other end, it also says the church is needed by you. It's not either or. It's not the church needs you and you don't need the church. We need each other. And I'm saying, I'm a part of you. I need the church to help in the equipping of my life so that I can continue to do what God has called me to do. And so do all of us in the room. So do all of us joining online. We all are in need of repair. See, the church is here to equip you to do the work that God's called you to do. See, I think sometimes we get discouraged by just how imperfect the church is. Can I tell you something? Our church is, is way imperfect. You know why I know that? Because you've got some imperfect pastors. And the body, the church, is made up of a lot of imperfect people. But here's the thing. It's not that, oh, everything's imperfect, so we just go on about what we do. No, here, here's the hope. Paul said it starts with people becoming believers and receiving grace, receiving their portion. Say yes to Jesus, portion of grace for what God intends for me to do. Then all these people have to be available to leadership who will equip, who will mend them, for ministry. But who's that ministry for? The same people who are being mended. It is this circle that never ends. We need to be mended. Leadership's here to, just to help facilitate that. All we're doing is trying to, trying to swirl the pot. Hey, let's keep going because we've got to be mended so that we can help others be mended. And then we, we're mended again because something's out, our ribs out of alignment or, or our knees out of joint and we got to get it back in. We got to get it repaired. We got to get the supply where it needs to be so that we can continue to put more people in the circle and the cycle of discipleship so that they would be equipped to do the work that God's called them to do. And here's what happens. When we mend nets, we catch more fish, which is what God has asked us to do. Is it, go and make disciples, baptizing. This is, this is our mission that we would go and reach people. All of us share in that. That's not a pastor's mission. That's not a church's mission. That is the body of Christ. When we say yes to Jesus, we are saying yes to the mission he's called us for. Then we've got to recognize, oh, I need to be a part of a church where I can be equipped and I can be fixed and I can be mended so that I can do the work that God has called me to. The mission is big. The repairs have to happen. Building has to go on. And here's what I want you to really recognize is that he chose you. You may have been rejected by everyone and everything else, but not God. You may feel inadequate to do the work, not in the body of Christ. You may think that someone else can do that. But he has given you the grace for your purpose. I think it's a tragedy when we look and say, well, somebody else will respond to the call. Somebody else will respond to the ask. Somebody else will participate. Somebody else will be a part. If he spoke it to you, it's for you to accomplish. 
It's for you to take the grace that he's given you. It's not for somebody else. Now, here's what I know. God's a big God, and if you say no, he's going to portion some grace to somebody else. But I don't want to live my life knowing that the body that I was a part of could have made a bigger impact if I'd said yes. I don't want to live my life that when I get to the end of it, I say, oh, well, I've got this empty plot of land that I could have done something with, but I never did anything with it. I don't want to live my life knowing that I took the grace that God gave me and I squandered it on all the little things and never bought what he had reserved for me up top. Because when I'm with my boys, I'm constantly trying to teach them, hey, if you'll take this, there's better stuff. The higher shelf you go, the better it is. But you know why they don't get it? Because they haven't matured. And here's what I want you to understand today is that ministry paves the way for maturity. This is how we grow. This is how we continue to heal. Lastly, I, I want us to just touch on this just for a moment. Is that a healthy body will grow. Paul wraps up this passage and he says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speak the truth in love and we will grow to become in every, every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Our aim is that we would not be a bunch of infants tossed around by the waves. Now, one of my favorite things as a dad is when summertime rolls around to go to the pool, go to the beach, go to any body of water with my kids. Why? Because I can feel like Superman when I'm just like, let's launch you. <laughs> Or when they were real little, we had this little, little float that we put the kids in and we've got pictures of both boys just sleep, you know, just to sleep in it. And I would normally get around and I'd like swim them around the pool and I'd push them and I'd pull them and I'd spin them if they were awake, trying to get a laugh out of them. But here's what would take place in that season they would go everywhere that I pushed or pulled them. Why? Because they hadn't grown and matured enough to resist the influence of their dad. Now here's the great thing. As a dad, I love my kids and I'm not gonna steer them into danger. I'm not intentionally. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not gonna take them down a path they're not supposed to be on. I'm going to lead them in a direction of where we can go on this journey together. But we live in a time where there are a lot of people trying to grab hold of your raft. They're trying to grab hold of your floaties and they're seeing just how much they can push you, how much they can pull you, how much they can spin you around. And if we have not planted ourselves to be equipped and repaired and healed in a part of what God's plan is. If we're not growing, we will not have the ability to resist what is coming our way. There's a reason that God talks to us about growing and in itself and speaking truth in love. Because sometimes truth hurts. But if it's said in love, it's at the root of who God is because God is love. Everything that we read in the teachings and God's word through scripture does not always feel good. But neither does the pruning process. But what happens every time we prune, every season, if you somewhat know what you're doing, you should prune to the extent that it should provide growth on the other side. So I'm not telling you repairs are always going to feel good. Repairs cost a lot of money and they're a big headache. But if we don't repair, the house is going to deteriorate. It's going to crumble. In the same way, we as believers have got to make sure we're putting ourselves in a place where we can be repaired and we're in a place where we can be a part of growth because a healthy body will begin to grow. And then all of a sudden when things start to swim our way and things try to grab hold of our raft, we say, hey, 
My kids do it now. If I tried, if I tried to put Cohen, who's, who's seven, in that raft, number one, he wouldn't fit. Number two, he'd be like kicking me and trying to hit me. And what are you doing, dad? Probably because of embarrassment, not just, <laughs> I may try it this summer. Well, I'll tell you, I'll circle back this summer, tell you how it goes. There's something that takes place as we grow because we're able to, we're able to swim. And here's what happens. When we start to swim, we can help others that we may see floating in a raft and say, hey, brother, hey, sister, you don't need to be there. Do you see where you're, you're headed for the waterfall? <laughs> you're headed for rocks. There's a shark in the ocean. Whatever the case may be, we are helping to rescue because we ourselves are mature. But put two infants and two floaties in a raft and tell them how to go save somebody. Can't do it. But as we grow, we're able to participate in a greater capacity of what God intends. Now, here's the thing. Why do, we, why do we grow? It's not, this is hard here. It's not for the individual, it's for the body. So this scripture is not saying, one of the authors I, I was reading as I was studying this, doubled down here to say, this is not for the individual, but for the body. But we have to play our part as individuals, but it's for the body. But everything in us says that it should be for us, not for other people. We fought this since the first sin. What was the first sin? It was a selfish sin because Adam and Eve chose to partake of the fruit. Why? Because they felt like God was holding out something better for them. And so they sinned and enter sin into this world. And all of our sin really comes down to a selfish decision that we know better or we want something that we can't have. And so we allow these things into our life and it creates separation. But this passage of scripture is really talking about, this is to strengthen the whole, not just the individual. There's a movie years ago. Um, I think it was like, I don't even remember the name of it. I was gonna try and take a stab, but you'll probably remember the name if you watched it because there was this really weird character that comes out and you see him and this half of his body is real normal. And then he turns and it's, he's been working out just one side of his body. One arm. And it looks like he's just been working that for years and he's got this muscular build and it's bulging all over here and then he's got this skinny little droopy arm on the other side. This is what happens when we just say, hey, I'm exercising for me and the part that I get to play. Is all of a sudden we get unproportioned, disproportioned in the process because God said, hey, you're supposed to be a part of the body and it's supposed to help the body that every ligament and every blood vessel and every organ and every tendon and every bit of skin that's attached and every digit and every ear and eye and nose, all of it plays for a healthy body. Because I could have a real healthy hand, but if the rest of my body is dying and I don't do something about it, we're in trouble. But this is what happens when we say, hey, I'm gonna grow just so I can grow, so I can be better. No, 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 that's not why growth takes place. Growth takes place so that the body can be healthier and the body can be whole so that we can actually be repaired and catch more fish to fulfill the mission of which God has put us on this earth. See, I'm not challenging you today so that we get roles filled as a church. I'm, I, I'm challenging you today because I believe that God's plan is for the body to grow in health. And I believe healthy things grow. And I believe a healthy body will grow. Now, here's what I've said. I've told our staff this. I, I, I've told our board this. I, I've told friends this. I don't care what limit and grace God has on my life for leadership of this church. We will continue to grow healthier. So it doesn't matter. God may have a number out there that says, hey, Greenville First will not be beyond this number. I don't know that. But if there's a number out there, that doesn't mean we hit that number and we stop. That means we continue to pursue health so that other things can grow and we can launch new works and help other churches and launch more church plants and see the kingdom of God expand because it's not what's happening at 1105 Haywood Road. It's what God's doing in his kingdom that we wanna be a part of. So I would even go as far as to say, hey, we don't just want to see our body healthy and whole. We want to see the big church healthy and whole. That we would grow into spaces and crevices all around this world where darkness is occupied, but light is coming and we get to be a part of it. See, I see a church 
where even if you weren't raised in a Christian home, you can hop onto a team in our children's ministry where there are going to be leadership positions that are going to help equip you to show you what it's like to love your kids and point them to Jesus. I see a church where there may be giftings and grace that God's put on your life for the marketplace that were developed and called out from a young age. One of my favorite small groups we've got launched this semester is one of our student small groups and it's called like influencers and they've got students that are going in a studio every week and they are creating stuff. You know why my heart gets happy about that? Because God is the ultimate creator and how incredible for young people to discover the creativeness nature of their God, of our God in them, that maybe one day this becomes their vocation. Because you know what we have in our church? We have wedding videographers and photographers and creatives all around. What better place than to hear from God than in his presence and being a part of his body? I see a church where even if you didn't have the greatest church experience growing up, maybe you're wounded, maybe, maybe church wasn't friendly to you. You walked into a church one time, nobody said, hey, nobody greeted you, and you walked out and you continued on your path away from Jesus. Yet here you find yourself today. And I see a church where people would wake up and realize, hey, that may have been my church experience. I refuse for that to be anybody else's. So I'm gonna find everybody that feels disconnected and I'm gonna be the friendliest face and I'm gonna be the first face that they see in the parking lot. Or I'm gonna be the first face that they see at the door. Or I'm gonna be the first face that shakes their hand when whoever tells us to, to meet and greet. I'm gonna choose a different path to be a part of the body see a church where people who have met Jesus get so passionate about the transformation of what he's done in their life that they refuse to walk by empty nets anymore. That they say, hey, I'll do whatever I have to to pick up a net, to mend a net so that we can reach more people for Jesus because I see what Jesus has done in my life and I refuse to watch people walk without him. See, I see a church that's healthy and growing that we continue to equip and mend and teach and lead and learn and grow from each other, that we're a healthy body fulfilling everything that God has for us. We choose to grow when we say yes to everything God has. Now, this is why we have, we have had this thing called Growth Track. And we're gonna talk a little bit more because we're making some changes to it. Why are we making changes to it? because we don't want things to be obstacles for people to say yes to God. Because here's what we know. When growth track was four weeks, well, I got it four weeks, that's long. So we cut it to three weeks. I mean, we're trying to streamline, hey, I can't stay after I come to first service or I come to the second service, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we'll make it available online. You know why? Because I wanna give every, every excuse you may have of where, why you can't get onto a team, we're gonna try to erase it the best we can. But here's what I want you to do today. If you're like, hey, I'm a believer pastor and I'm not serving anywhere, but I, I, I hear you. I hear the voice of God today and I know that I'm supposed to do something different. I just want you to fill out a connection card and just circle, I think the dream team is right there on the back of the card. You can complete it online. However you want to, stop by the Connection Center, talk to somebody. Why? Because I believe this is the next step for everybody in their journey that we should be a part of the body, not just on the outside but it all starts by saying yes to Jesus before any of that matters. So I'm gonna invite everybody to bow your head, close your eyes as we close today. If you're here and you just say, hey, Pastor Josh, I, I hear you talk about a body, I hear you, I, I hear you but I, I need to say yes to Jesus first. Maybe you've wandered away from him. Maybe you've never lived in relationship with him. None of that matters. You just have an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. So if you're here today and you just say, hey, pastor, I, I need to pray that prayer. I, I just want to agree with you today. I, I wanna ask Jesus to be Lord of my life. Will you just slip your hand up? Nobody's looking in the room, balcony. Hey, we're all gonna repeat this prayer together. If you can do that with me. Dear Jesus, forgive me. For all of my sin, I need you. I need you to lead me. I wanna love you. 
Help me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, can we celebrate those today who have made a decision to follow Jesus? This is the most exciting part of service when people say yes to Jesus. Why? Because eternity changes. But scripture says, faith without works is dead. I'm tired of seeing a bunch of zombie Christians say, hey, I believe, but I'm not doing anything about it. I don't want to see believers go into heaven sucking a bottle. So I just want that to rest with you today. Now, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, I want you to hear me. We want to walk on this journey with you. Whether you're online, you're in the room. We've got a following Jesus book that's just some next steps. What are the basics for me to say yes to Jesus? What does it look like in my life? And you can get that book two ways. You can text Made New to the number on the screen, or you can stop by one of our connection centers in the lobby or in the courtyard out back, because we want to journey with you from where you are to where Jesus wants you to be.